Good evening and welcome to Doctors on Call. I'm Dr. Peter Nalen, Professor and Head of the Department of Family Medicine and Biobehavioral Health and Associate Dean for Rural Medicine at the University of Minnesota Medical School, Duluth Campus. I'm your host for our program tonight on lower extremity, foot, knee, and hip problems. The success of this program is very dependent on you, the viewer, so please call in your questions or email them to ask at wdse.org. The telephone numbers can be found at the bottom of your screen. Our panelists this evening include Dr. Sandy Stover, a family medicine physician and faculty member in the Department of Family Medicine and Biobehavioral Health at the Medical School Duluth campus. Dr. Patrick Hall, an orthopedic surgeon with Orthopedic Associates of Duluth. And Dr. E. Tolga Hanhan, a family medicine physician with St. Luke's Lakeview Medical Clinic in Two Harbors. It is membership drive time here at WDSE, so we have a bank of phone volunteers in the studio to take your questions and calls of support. And now on to tonight's program on lower extremity, knee, foot, and hip problems. And our first question, Dr. Han Han, it's already come in about uh, osteoporosis of the hip. What can prevent it from getting worse? So osteoporosis is basically a thinning of the bones, if you want to think about it like that. Um, and how to keep it from getting worse, uh, there's a lot of things people can do. Um, if somebody is smoking, uh, if they're able to quit smoking, that would be probably number one. Uh, exercise is very important. Um, if we can keep our lower extremities healthy and moving, that's good for the hip itself. And, uh, and good vitamin uh, D intake as well as probably some calcium can improve the health of the bones as well. But if I had to pick one thing, it would probably be exercise. Exercise is medicine. and and it keeps your bones very healthy. Well, continuing on hip problems, Dr. Hall, you uh, brought an example or a, of a uh, hip prosthesis. Could you tell us a little about what we're looking at? Yeah, this is an example of a hip replacement, and uh, the indication for a hip replacement is somebody who has end-stage arthritis, and they've usually tried some form of conservative management uh, that's either failed or, or hasn't um, succeeded in alleviating their symptoms adequately enough. And so this just shows an example of what the parts look like. And uh, so there's a femoral part and an acetabular or a socket part. And we basically just replace the surfaces of the joint. So we, we remove the ball and then we resurface both sides of the joint. So instead of bearing weight through the, the worn out articular surfaces, you're, wearing, you're bearing the weight through artificial parts, and they're made out of uh, metal and plastic, essentially. It's a little more complicated than that, some of the metal alloys and things, but that's essentially what the bearing surfaces typically are made out of. Could you um, point out the parts that are in the leg and the parts that are in the hip? Sure. So if we're looking at this, we're going to kind of turn this so we can see it. Um, so let's uh, actually, actually, maybe I'll hold it up for the audience if you can see it. So this is the, the, the bone of the femur, so that's the leg bone. And so the ball part comes off the leg bone and goes into the socket, but we remove the ball part and replace it with this metal part here that, um, that goes down into the femur. And then the socket part has two parts. It has a metal shell that goes into the socket and then a plastic liner that snaps in and the metal ball articulates with the plastic liner. And so that recreates a hip joint that functions just like a normal hip joint. Well, I imagine we'll get additional questions about the hip. The next question is for Dr. Stover. A caller wants to know, after many years of planter's warts or calluses, uh, wondering if there's some effective or magic way of, of resolving it. Well, that's a good question because that's one of the more common things to cause pain in the foot. And if you have pain in the foot, it's hard to walk normally, which can cause pain in the knee or the hip as well. Uh, the, the issue is kind of two-sided. So trying to prevent calluses from forming uh, can mean, mean that it's, it's important to pay attention to the shoes themselves. Is there anything rubbing on there? Is there a weight-bearing bone that's lost some padding from natural aging? Maybe a little more padding in the shoe could be helpful. They're actually all the way up to the special orthotic shoes that can help accommodate to different changes in our feet as we, grow, as we age. 
Uh, the warts are a little bit different in that they're actually something that's caused by a virus that will get right in that kind of, t of upper, upper layer of the skin in that, in that thicker uh, normal callusing area of the skin. And if you do nothing about a wart, it eventually will resolve on its own as the immune system finds it and like all, all good immune systems uh, can get the virus taken care of. But it can take a while, it can take several years sometimes and in that process the, the body will callus around the wart and it's like walking on a stone in your shoe, it doesn't feel very good. So you can shave off either calluses or warts with something like there's a brand name called the Petty Egg or some very fine shaving opportunities or some pumice stone kind of a thing. But the best way to remove it is actually to, to kind of, uh, uh, you can use a little bit of either some a very mild acid that's that like Compound W, which is a brand name for something over the counter. Um, or you can come see a physician who can do a little bit more deeper um, uh, uh, activation of the wart so that the body recognizes and helps it resolve on its own. Mm -hmm. So long answer short, good shoes or paying attention to blisters before they become problems, um, paying attention to, wart, to weight bearing, and then uh, checking in with a, your family physician just to get an idea about specific mm -hmm. uh, issues in your own feet. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Han Han, uh, can you tell us a bit about the early evaluation of an ankle sprain? Uh, sure. Uh, we see a lot of ankle sprains are very common. Uh, most commonly, uh, people kind of will roll their foot, you know, uh, basketball games and things like that where people jump up. It's a, it's a very common injury. And uh, people come in with this kind of swollen ankle and uh, it's very painful and they may be limping. Um, and uh, our job is uh, uh, physici physicians is to find out is it truly a sprain or do we suspect a fracture. Uh, they're, they're managed differently. A sprain is I think a big deal actually. It can cause uh, chronic ankle problems when you know years down the road so those also have to be managed but they are managed a little bit differently. Thank you. Dr. Hall this question seems to be a bit about uh, range of motion of both legs around the hips. A, a caller is concerned that sometimes the left leg can't quite meet over to the right leg, somewhat the way, it's, as the caller put it, magnets might repel each other. Is there something about the um, range of motion of the left leg coming over to the right that might imply a hip problem? Yeah, it could. You know, if, if somebody has had normal range of motion and their range of motion is decreasing for some reason, it could indicate that there's some arthritis in the hip. Um, sometimes with arthritis of the hip, one of the first signs is decreased range of motion. So one of the things that people tend to, uh, to realize first is that they have a hard time putting shoes and socks on because they can't flex their hip and rotate their hip enough to get their shoes and socks on and that's kind of an early sign uh, there are other reasons too. Sometimes people have hip dysplasia and maybe they've got an abnormal hip joint that just doesn't move as well as the other one. Um, they, it can also happen from knee problems. So uh, when people start to wear out their knees, oftentimes they wear out their knees asymmetrical. So when you look at somebody from the front, the normal leg alignment is to be a little bit knock-kneed. And so it, that configuration centers the hip and the knee and the ankle. But when people wear their knees out, oftentimes they wear out the inside first because that's where most of the weight gets transferred. So when they wear that, the knees out in the, on the medial part, they start to become a little bit more bow-legged. And when they do, they notice that they can't bring their knees together as well. Okay. So that it could be, could be a hip, a knee, or even a foot problem. Thank you for that. Dr. Stover, a uh, caller asks about post polio exercises, especially with lower body problems, uh, even to the point of not being able to uh, walk. What exercises could help the legs and the lower body? That's a, that's a very good question and it's a little complicated because the polio process, when, when that virus invades the body, it causes some muscle damage. And usually it tends to hit younger people, but because young muscles are, are overall in good shape, the body can compensate for years. There comes a time though, as we all age, that muscles just gradually do become a little less vibrant. And in that process, the old damage from the polio can become more apparent again. 
So it's difficult to exercise tissue that's become damaged, but it is important to consider how to balance out the, the muscles that are there so that you don't overtire or, or like uh, Dr. Hall was talking about, when there's an imbalance mm -hmm. issue in the, in the feet or the knees or the hips, it, it transmits other places. My best suggestion for post-polio syndrome is to work with um, some of our wonderful physical medicine rehabilitation people or physical therapists to kind of help in supporting the areas that aren't working quite as well and then uh, working to support and exercise the parts that are still um, a vibrant muscle. Yep. Dr. Han Han, a caller asks about fallen arch of the foot. Uh, what is it and uh, how might you treat it? Uh, so fallen arch uh, is essentially uh, loss of that natural arch uh, created by the plantar fascia. I imagine we'll talk about that at some point uh, tonight. Um, and so it's basically, you know, uh, all of a sudden your foot kind of takes on that flatter shape. And so what can be done about it, I think one of the better things is supporting that arch of the foot. Uh, we, you can do that with orthotics, you can do that with uh, custom insoles, uh, just very good shoes, even running shoes can sometimes do it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Hall, this one's about uh, running and forecasts for joint issues in hips and knees. Um, is running a marathon past 40 okay or is it an invitation for the problem? You know, I think running is okay after 40. Uh, you know, a lot of people run and it's their passion. And so um, in our office, we have some physical therapists that are really good uh, running uh, experts and they, they sometimes get people on the treadmill, they watch the way they run, they give suggestions. But I think when you run on hard surfaces, it is hard on the joints. And so we recommend good cushioned shoes, good running shoes and replacing your running shoes periodically when they wear out so that you can help cushion the joints when you're running on hard surfaces. And we see a lot of that around you know, May and June around here because the marathon is usually in mid-June. And so we see a lot of overuse uh, injuries from running. And some of it has to do with shoe wear, some of it has to do with the surfaces that people run on. Um, but I think it's okay to continue to run and, and, and be active. But I think being smart about the surfaces that you run on, maybe cross-training somewhat so you're not always doing a lot of repetitive impact on your joints. Sometimes cross-training by biking or doing something that's a little less, less strenuous on the joints can be helpful. So, um, yeah, so we recommend those things. Um, but, yeah, I think it's okay to keep running after 40. We, we have people that run the marathon, you know, in their 50s, 60s, and 70s even. So, yeah. Just, just to stress that, uh, the notion about footwear, uh, most of us probably do not replace our shoes enough. Yeah. I mean, there's some recommendations that runners should be replacing them every 250 miles, yeah. which is not a lot of miles if you're an avid runner. Yeah. Because of the wear and tear and the cushioning that might not be available anymore in yeah. the older yeah, shoes. Yeah, the cushions right. kind of crunch down after a while, they're not as effective. So. Well, Dr. Stover, this question is actually about two feet, and um, if someone is having bunions on both feet, would the surgery be recommended on both feet at the same instant? And that's a good question. Uh, the issue with bunions is where that, that first knuckle on the foot that's basically with the big toe uh, gets enlarged. It actually is, is turning in. It makes it look like it's getting larger. There's some wear and tear in the joint. It thickens a little bit. And bunions are a, f a little bit of family related. Uh, it's not something that's really due to footwear that we have. It's, it's something that's more of a inherent changes that are gonna occur in a body. And if there's no pain in the bunions or if you can get shoes to accommodate that change in that bulge, you don't really want surgery because the issue with bunion surgery is, is that that natural change that's happening in individuals who get bunions is going to happen again even post-surgery the change can occur so if there's no pain you don't need surgery if there is pain that's affecting your gait like we've been talking about it'll affect your knees and your hips too then you want to talk with someone about getting it. I, the problem is it's, it's essentially um, it affects the bone enough, almost like a fracture, that you have to be off that foot for a while. So to do both at once would make it very difficult to get around. Mm -hmm. So the recommendation is one at a time, but it's another good conversation to have with a physician about is this the right time for you as an individual? Mm -hmm. um, is, there, is, is waiting a little bit, giving you more time uh, to avoid a second surgery? Dr. Han Han, we have a question about peripheral neuropathy, what are current recommended treatments 
for peripheral neuropathy of the lower extremities? Yeah, so peripheral, peripheral neuropathy is basically uh, nerve damage, if you want to think about it like that. And it's, it's a big deal for the lower extremities in particular. Uh, if, if you really think about the body, the feet are as far away as you can possibly get from our spine, which is where these kind of nerves come out of. So feet are affected by the peripheral neuropathy. And I think the, uh, the question is, why do you have a peripheral neuropathy? The most common reason uh, in our country is from diabetes. And so uh, it's all about diabetes care. So uh, making sure that the diabetes is well controlled. Uh, there are medications that can um, uh, kind of, if the neuropathy is painful, which is the case for some individuals, there's some medications that can be used for that. Uh, but uh, it's basically s supportive. Um, one of the dangers of peripheral neuropathy is you may not be aware of some foot damage that's actually happening. For example, you could be walking with a rock in your shoe and not even know it. So we tell our folks with peripheral neuropathy to make sure they're looking at their feet in a reg on a regular basis. Dr. Hall, could you help our viewers understand the difference between knee pain that's in front of the kneecap and knee pain that might be behind the kneecap and might, might be explaining those? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's hard to distinguish where the pain is coming from when people have anterior knee pain. Uh, a lot of times, uh, knee problems come from the patellofemoral joint or the extensor mechanism. So uh, it can be overuse and stressing the extensor mechanism of the knee, and you can get some quad tendonitis or some patellar tendonitis. And those usually present with anterior knee pain that's palpable. When people have patellofemoral arthritis, that means arthritis in the joint between the kneecap and the femur. Uh, that also presents with anterior knee pain uh, and crepitation if the joint's uh, starting to wear out. Uh, a lot of times those conditions are aggravated by going up and down stairs or squatting down to pick something up off the floor uh, because it accentuates your use of the extensor mechanism of the knee. So people who uh, have those kinds of problems can usually walk on level ground pretty easily, but when they have to walk up hills or stairs, that's when they notice it the most. And that's because they, they really use that extensor part of their knee more when they, when they do those activities. And so uh, it's probably important to, to come and have it evaluated, start with some x-rays, and then uh, maybe even an MRI if, if there's some question about what's causing it. For our viewers, you mentioned crepitus. Could you indicate on your knee model where that crepitus is uh, coming yeah, from? Yeah, this is a, not a, a, a knee model. This is a knee model with a knee replacement in it. But um, if you look at this knee model, this shows the patella. And what's really not shown here is the muscles, but you can see the, the kneecap connects down to the tibia through what's called the patellar tendon. And so the crepitation happens between the patella and the femur when the knee is flexed and extended. And really what you're, what you're hearing is that crunching and, and grinding sensation that you hear when two uneven joint surfaces rub on one another. And so that indicates that there's some wear and tear of the patellofemoral joint. Thank you. Dr. Stover, a caller wants to know, uh, the caller has Raynaud's, and while sleeping, what could be done to not wake up with cold, tingling hands? And Raynaud's is actually something that's, that's not happening because of temperature outside or inside, although it can be triggered by cold temperature, but it's a vascular problem. Some people will wear uh, wool uh, kind of gloves on at night to help uh, retain heat in the hands a little bit better. Um, that, that's probably my favorite way to do it, but overall, that with Ray Nose, you may want to check with your doctor just to make sure there's no other process going on in the body that could be leading to that. Dr. Han Han, a caller asks, uh, why might legs be aching while walking? Uh, there's so many reasons. <laughs> uh, some questions I'd have in, in mind uh, would be what part of the leg, uh, you know, um, Probably all of us have had leg pain for all kinds of different reasons. Uh, I don't run very often, but when I do, I get some leg aching the next day uh, just because I'm not used to it. Uh, but yeah, I, I, there's, the leg is pretty complex, so. Sounds like worth an ex examination and history and physical. I think so. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, very briefly, Dr. Stover, are there insert cushions for 
alternatives to replacing the running shoes? Oh, that's a good question. I was actually thinking about what we were talking. Um, ideally, the, the shoes are built with a cushion that's in the rubbery part as well as on the insert part. So the shoes are, good running mm -hmm. shoes are complex. But I have replaced using gel pads and gotten more, weight, more work, wear out of a shoe. Mm -hmm. Well, very well. As mentioned at the beginning of our program, it is membership week here at WDSE. Doctors on Call is such a special and unique local show, but requires your support to make it happen each week. We'll be back after learning about why your donations to WDSC are so important. Welcome back to Doctors on Call. Let's get back to questions on our topic, lower extremity, knee, foot, and hip problems. Dr. Hall, this question regards Leg length, is it common to have a leg get longer after a robotic total knee replacement? And the caller mentions, for instance, a half inch longer. Well, you know, sometimes people uh, just normally have a leg length discrepancy. So, you know, if you were to take, you know, a bunch of people at random and accurately measure their leg lengths, a lot of people have a small leg length discrepancy and they, they don't really know it. And so until it gets to be a little bit bigger, like maybe a half an inch or more, uh, it's typically, a lot of times goes unnoticed. Um, so after a knee replacement, uh, sometimes the leg does appear or feel a little bit longer, especially with a big deformity. So you can imagine if somebody has a big bow-legged deformity and then you correct that deformity and straighten the knee out, it does add length. And so somebody who's been used to walking on a shorter leg for a long period of time and then has that deformity corrected is going to feel like that leg is longer because they're used to walking on it feeling short. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it may be something like that. It's really not that common to, to end up with a big leg length discrepancy from a knee replacement because the, most of the knee replacement systems are designed to put the same amount of bone or the, the same amount of space back with the prosthesis that was removed uh, from the bone during the knee replacement. So uh, there's different reasons why somebody might feel like, like one leg is longer than the other or why they might have a leg length discrepancy. But I think with a knee replacement, it's, it's unusual to end up with a large leg length discrepancy. Thank you. Dr. Stover, this question is about what scan could be done next. A caller's had two hips replaced and a history of bone cancer in the back. Hips are now starting to feel painful. And the caller wants to know what kind of scan could be done next. That's a good question because the metal that can be in replacements can be distorting in things like a CT scan. Depending on the kind of metal, uh, there may still be an opportunity to do something like an MRI. It depends on the kind of metal. Um, but I, something else that's, that's very an interesting to use in, in orthopedic care is an ultrasound for soft tissue issues. It won't help with the bones, but you can look to see if there's been a tendon uh, that's become inflamed or looking a little bit more at, at areas of swelling and what they're coming from. Um, there's, there are some other kinds of scans, like PET scans that look at uh, for cancer, things like that. So that's, um, it kind of depends again, again mm -hmm. on what part you're really interested in looking at, what part is hurting. Dr. Han Han, a caller asks about a deep vein issue contributing to lymphedema and what activities could be avoided if one has lymphedema, perhaps to make it better. Yeah, so lymphedema is a term where lymph tissue, which is part of our immune system, builds up in one extremity. And it could happen in really any of your extremities. And uh, it's very challenging to deal with. There's no very easy solution for lymphedema. There's uh, a lot of products that are made that can kind of squeeze the extremity and, uh, and, and try to push some of that fluid back and out of the extremity just for comfort. And so what should be avoided? Uh, probably uh, anything that hurts. Um, uh, but in general, we should try to keep our, our uh, extremities moving. The more our legs move, for example, the more our uh, muscles will pump that tissue back. Uh, so one thing that should probably be avoided is just sitting uh, still for long periods of time. Dr. Hall, this question is about 
the knee sounding like cellophane after the knee replacement. It's not painful, but the patient hears it. Yeah, that, that can happen. Um, it's usually caused by some uh, synovial tissue or scar tissue buildup around the, the patellar component. It doesn't typically happen right away after a knee replacement, but happens maybe a, six months to a year later sometimes. Uh, and it usually, it can sometimes be a really audible sound, you know, kind of a crunching sound. Uh, it, it, there's a name for it, it's called patellar clunk syndrome sometimes. And oftentimes the solution to that problem is to do a knee arthroscopy and go in and trim out the, the, the tissue that builds up around the patellar component. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that happens sometimes. I, I, I wouldn't say it's f real frequent, but maybe you know one or two percent of the time. And it almost always responds to a knee arthroscopy to trim that tissue out. Uh, and I've, I've had patients that have had that uh, even twice. You know, maybe you know maybe early on, and then later on in life, even with some of the scar tissue that builds up. And uh, the knee arthroscopy almost always solves that problem. Dr. Stover. Could there be a relationship between back surgery and subsequent uh, burning on the top of a left foot or itching on the bottom of a right foot? Uh, and the, when there's issues related to the back that require surgery, it's often to release uh, pressure that's kind of come across one of the nerves that leaves the spinal, co spinal cord and then feeds the leg muscles and the sensory system in the legs. And so um, the back surgery itself doesn't always completely resolve. It's, may, it's intended to help uh, improve function, but sometimes there's still some inflammation to the nerves that feed those areas. And the other sensations that come with our nerves are things like burning, itching, uh, sometimes a feeling of cold prickliness uh, or a, a light tickly sort of sensation. And so those kinds of sensations are best dealt with by using a positive alternative sensation. Um, sometimes creams can do that or a, a, an elect a slight electrical stimulation. Mm -hmm. uh, so that again, that's something that can be dealt with if it's bothersome. Some people find that it's present, but it doesn't really bother them. So there isn't a requirement that something be done as long as there's good muscle function and, and strength in the legs. Mm -hmm. Dr. Han Han, uh, a patient has, uh, a caller has broken a bone in the foot back in August in fairly good health. It's still hurting at times and getting swollen. What are you considering or what might be done? Uh, so a bone in the foot that has broken. And so uh, we're about four months out and if it's still troublesome, uh, it's, it's worth you know, uh, thinking about if the bone healed properly. Uh, that's kind of my biggest question. You know, feet are very important. If you think about the stress that the feet kind of carry of our, our weight. Um, so that's worth a look. Uh, let's say for the sake of argument that it did heal properly, but the patient, uh, the person still ends up with some kind of tenderness and kind of some swelling from time to time. Uh, you know, uh, you can develop arthritis from broken bones uh, once they've healed, and uh, so and that can pass on to the joints right around the the break itself. Um, but it's probably worth getting it looked at to see if the bones are where they should be. Thank you. And Dr. Hall, this caller wants to know about why knees might be aching only at night. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Some people complain of aching at night. Uh, it can be from stress that, that happened during the day and a lot of times during our day we're not you know, paying attention to our knees because we're focused on the tasks that we're doing during the day and sometimes they, that when patients go to bed they just feel it more at night. Um, so it could, be, it could be a result of the, the activity during the day. Um, so I'm not really sure how to answer that question other than to say that sometimes it's related to activity and uh, sometimes just people notice it more at night. And Dr. Stover, this question is uh, regarding advice after cortisone uh, injection. Uh, a caller wants to ride the exercise bike but is uncertain if she can. Um, what might be the recommendations around activity after cortisone shot? 
So cortisone is a steroid, so it's an anti-inflammatory. It's often uh, accompanied by a little bit of lidocaine, which is an anesthetic. And if those two are given together, the knee will often feel quite a bit better in that first 24 hours. I think my biggest recommendation to people if there's been a cortisone shot is not to overdo it in that mm -hmm. first day when, you're, when you've got a little bit of that anesthetic on board and doing too much can then increase the reason that the inflammation is there in the first place. I think it's also um, helpful to think about what kind of exercise you're looking at, working with uh, a, f a physical therapist or a physician to kind of design the right thing for the knee to strengthen the, the, the knee to support whatever the problem is going on in there. But in the first 24 hours, a light exercise is good and important to do. You just don't want to jump in to a, a more aggressive form until you've had a chance to build the strength back up mm -hmm. in the knee. Mm -hmm. Dr. Han Han, what are current treatments for symptomatic peripheral neuropathy? Uh, so the neuropathy uh, question again. Uh, so there's a lot of various options and there's various medicines. Uh, a lot of nerve agents are used. Um, one of the issues with nerve agents is uh, oftentimes they can make people kind of feel fatigued or run down. So those are somewhat limiting. So uh, if some people can tolerate those medications, some people cannot. Uh, and then, as Dr. Stover suggested, there's some cre creams that people can use. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of options out there. I mean, a, a lot of them have been tested, and some of them have not. That doesn't mean they don't work. Uh, so it's just worth experimenting uh, with all the different options. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dr. Stover, uh, a few callers are asking about uh, inserts for their shoes and who they might consult about fitting them well? I, and that's a good question. So um, there's kind of two sorts of inserts that we've talked about tonight. There are uh, kind of inserts that are custom made by an orthodontist uh, that, that uh, can be helpful for something like an arch support or if some people have heel issues related to tendonitis in the foot. Uh, and that should be fitted by someone, a, a podiatrist or an orthodontist who specializes in making inserts. You can buy commercial products that are more cushioning. So as opposed to supporting a structure, it's cushioning the pounding that we were talking about earlier that can put wear and tear on, on the joints that are further north. And so the gel pads that have been a nice technology, I've been around long enough to know before gel pads, we most, mostly had foam. They didn't hold up as well as the, as the gel pads do. So trying out gel pads that are commercially done can be helpful. There really isn't one place I'd go to get uh, specific advice unless you're doing the, the inserts to, to correct something or to support something that's changing in your foot. Mm -hmm. um, I, hope, I think that, that's probably my mm -hmm. best suggestion. And Dr. Hall, regarding the knee, and we're familiar with abbreviations like ACL, for example. What is more commonly injured, the anterior or the posterior cruciate ligaments and why? Oh, so by far the anterior cruciate ligament. So uh, the ACL is a common injury in sports. It usually happens with a twisting hyperextension type injury. But the PCL is a much stronger ligament, and so it's harder to injure the PCL. It usually takes a higher energy injury. Oftentimes it's a motor vehicle accident where somebody hits the dashboard with the front of their knee or they fall really hard on the front of their knee. So it takes a lot more force to disrupt the PCL, and I bet you we see ACL, ACL injuries probably 10 times more frequently than PCL injuries. Thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Han Han, a, uh, Power lifter weighs uh, 350 pounds, and is it the lifting or the weight that might be causing aching in the knees virtually all the time? Uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, weight and knees uh, have an inherent relationship, right? So uh, the more somebody weighs, the more we're asking of that knee joint. Uh, and uh, so weight is really tough on knees, um, and uh, if and so if 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 people are overweight, if they're able to lose weight, that can be very good for the knees. And Dr. Stover, a caller would like to know about the effectiveness of Voltaren gel for arthritic knees. 
That's a really good question because that's been a, a more a recent kind of addition to the things we can do for inflammation, and it's actually very effective. So it, it has to be something that's aching that's, that's closer to the surface. So for a deep hip pain, not, out, not just over the side where the trochanter is, but deep hip pain, it won't work as well. But for the knee or for tendons on the top of the hands or the feet, uh, for elbows, uh, mm -hmm. that can be super, very effective. Um, it's important, though, to remember not to use too much of any one kind of drug because there are side effects to anything. But following directions on the label or with the physician's uh, directions are important. Mm. And uh, this question is about uh, tendinosis and uh, tendosynovitis or tenosynovitis uh, affecting severe pain uh, in, the, in the leg and in the heel. And whether, um, if this has been going on for three years, uh, is there some surgery involved or more time? For me? Sure. Uh, so tendinitis and tenosynovitis are slightly different areas where inflammation is occurring. The synovium is, is referring more to the kind of the coating of the tendon or of, the, of that joint area. And so if it's affecting the heel, it makes me think of the Achilles tendon could be strained. It's part of a unit that goes all the way from the toes up mm. to the back of the calf. So anywhere in that system that tightens, it can set the rest of the system off. Mm -hmm. So um, doing stretch, doing, doing appropriate and, and kind of slow and steady stretching mm -hmm. in that area can be very helpful. Um, if, the, if something's been going on for three years, that chronic nature of it can sometimes sort of, it sort of is like a coal that continues to burn in that area. And so you have to find a way to change this, the stresses on that are pulling on that area to kind of cool that off so it has a chance then to be stretched and to heal up. Mm -hmm. So I, we kind of talked about physical therapy a couple of times today, but they are, they are experts in helping um, de uh, design an exercise program for individuals that, that meet the needs of an individual problem in a, in a joint system. Dr. Hall, what are the treatments for a torn Achilles tendon? Well, there's really two treatments, either operative or non-operative. Um, I think uh, if the tendon is torn and it's pretty well approximated, you can put that in a cast or a boot and slight plantar flexion, and oftentimes they'll heal. If it's torn and, and really retracted or separated by a large gap, then oftentimes we'll fix those surgically by uh, suturing it together and bringing those two ends together so that they're reapproximated and will heal kind of together instead of with scar tissue in the gap. So those are really the two options, either non-operative treatment by immobilization or surgery to fix the tendon. Does the patellar tendon also tear the way the Achilles tendon tears? It can, you know, it's, it it's, it's, uh, you know, connects the bottom of the kneecap to the tibial tubercle, which is that bump in front of the knee. Mm -hmm. And so that's what connects the quadricep to the tibia. And so with, you know, extreme strain injuries to the patellar tendon, it can rupture. And more commonly, I think the quad tendon is, is more commonly ruptured. Mm -hmm. But anytime those happen, it disrupts the extensor mechanism of the knee. And if you don't fix it, it can lead to a lot of, of disability because that's a pretty important part of your knee to be able to function mm -hmm. and you know, walk and go up and down stairs and all of those things that you need to do. And Dr. Hall, a, a brief uh, final question. Uh, can the knees get to the point where surgery won't help if it's bone on bone for both knees? Well, if it's bone on bone for both knees, that means you've worn through the cartilage on both sides of the joint. And so usually when it gets to that point, it's pretty painful. And that's about the time we start to, to recommend knee replacement surgery. So we try some of the conservative things like injections and medications and just activity modifications, uh, local pain relief modalities, and then just kind of avoiding the things you know are going to aggravate it. But once people have failed conservative treatment and they're bone on bone, that's when we talk about knee replacement surgery. And so, thank I think you. It, yeah. Great. Well, I'd like to uh, thank our panelists, Dr. Sandy Stover, Dr. Patrick Hall, and Dr. E. Tolga Hanhan. Please join Dr. Ray Christensen next week for a program on men's health and kidney stones when his panelists will be Dr. Josh Engelsyard. Dr. Nick Johnson, and Dr. Paul Sanford. Thank you for joining us tonight. This type of programming can only happen with viewer support. You can keep all the shows on WDSE WRPT healthy when you become a supporting member.